The Lord be with you. Welcome to this service of worship at River Road Presbyterian Church. We're so grateful that you've joined us for this online worship service. We invite you to uh, pass the peace in the comments and also share this video by clicking the share button uh, that is just below the video. Say hello to all your friends in the comments. We're so glad that you're here with us. As we continue in worship, let us read our sentences of scripture. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is so high that I cannot attain it. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks this day for a time to be together to worship you. We pray that you be in our midst. Give us a message today and send us forth to do your work and ministry in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
everyone welcome this morning we're continuing looking at stories in our lectionary um, stories about what happened with the church after Jesus rose from the dead and today we're reading a story out of the spark house Bible on page 510 and it's about Philip and the Ethiopian official and I'll read it to you and tell you a little bit about it Philip loved Jesus he tried to act like Jesus would every day Philip fed people who were poor and hungry and helped people who were sick. One day, God sent an angel to Philip. The angel told Philip to travel, travel on a hot, dry road and share God's love along the way. So Philip set out along the road. It sure is hot and dry, thought Philip. Then Philip looked up and was surprised. He saw a man from Ethiopia sitting in a chariot and reading a scroll. One of the horses was tired, so the chariot had stopped. Philip knew he had a chance to do the job God had given him. He ran to the chariot and said hello, and the man invited him to sit next to him. I see you're reading a scroll, said Philip. Yes, it's a scroll with words from the prophet Isaiah, but I really don't understand it, the Ethiopian said. They took turns reading the scroll out loud, and Philip talked about Jesus and explained what the scroll said. Soon the horse felt ready to go again, and Philip stayed in the chariot, and it was a very bouncy and bumpy ride. And the man from Ethiopia bumped into Philip as he said, Tell me more about Jesus. Philip told him Jesus was the Son of God. He came to earth to save us. The Ethiopian was so amazed that he wanted to be baptized. But where could they find some water for baptism on that hot, dry road? The surprises just kept coming that day. Philip and the man found a pool of water. Philip baptized the man, and God's love filled his heart. The Ethiopian told Philip that he would share the good news about Jesus with everyone, and Philip was happy to serve God. So this story comes after another story we're actually going to hear on May 23rd called Pentecost, and it comes after the story of the commission that we heard a couple weeks ago in Pathways class, the Great Commission to go baptize and preach about Jesus to all nations. So now Philip may have come down from Jerusalem into Africa and is walking, we think, maybe towards Ethiopia, which by the way would have taken 
almost two months walking. So he's a far way from home, and he meets the Ethiopian. And they talk about Jesus, and then the Ethiopian man decides that he wants to be baptized. What I want to tell you about that story today is maybe that was the beginning of a church in Ethiopia. We know there's still a church there today. We actually have Presbyterian churches there. I'm going to show you a few pictures. They're doing great work in God's name because Philip was sent by God and spoke about God and baptized. So here's some pictures of the church in Ethiopia ordaining new pastors, building a new church, putting the cornerstone in that church is the picture. They're doing something called cross-cultural mission in this picture, which means they are learning from folks from another church in another country, and the folks from another church in another country are learning about the church in Ethiopia. All so each church can be better at following God. We actually send missionaries there. Here's a picture of them. Their names are Michael and Rachel. Because Philip went somewhere that he wasn't sure what was going to happen or if he knew anybody, because Philip responded to God's command to go and make disciples, Philip helped to spread God's love, to spread God's word, and to help the church grow somewhere far away. And we can see the fruits of that today from the pictures from that church. That's what we're called to do too, to share God's love, to help one another, and sometimes go places unexpected to tell about God. Let's close in prayer. I say a line and you repeat after me. God, thank you for folks willing to travel long distances to share the good news of your love in Jesus Christ. Give us courage to share God's love with all people. And let's say together, amen. All right, see you next week. You know, I think everyone hungers for greatness. I think we hunger for it even if we've given up thinking that we'll ever find it and we're just muddling through life. I think the hunger for it remains. Today, we're beginning a new sermon series called Finding Greatness. And in this sermon series, we're going to examine David's early life for le lessons about greatness. This morning, we're going to be looking at the episode where David is introduced to us. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears of it? He will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. 
and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, Samuel looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel then went out for Ramah. May God bless this reading of Holy Scripture. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. The Lord our God, may the words that I speak and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was a cold January morning in Washington, D.C., and a young man walked into the metro station. He took out his violin, and he, he began to tune up and rosin the bow, and he was unexceptionally dressed. He was wearing blue jeans and a T-shirt and a, a hat, baseball hat that was down low over his shaggy hair. He threw a few dollars in the violin case to encourage passers-by to do the same, and he began to play. Now, it was a busy morning in L'Enfant Plaza. Thousands of people were on the way to work or home or school or wherever they were going, and it was noisy. Trains were coming and going, and people were rushing back and forth and talking on their cell phones. And yet, through all that busyness, the sound of his violin absolutely filled the metro station. It reverberated off the walls, full and sweet. It was impossible to ignore. Or was it? The fact is that for 45 minutes, at least 1,000 people walked by Joshua Bell while he played. Now, if he was any other busker, the fact that he only collected a handful of dollars would be, you know, it's kind of like par for the course. But Joshua Bell wasn't just any busker. He was perhaps the world's most renowned violinist. And he was playing one of the hardest, most difficult pieces to play on a violin. And he was playing on a $3 million instrument. And yet, even though the sound was filling the station, almost everybody ignored it. Nobody stopped for even a moment. Because it didn't look like anybody special. Only after the video of him playing to the indifferent crowd went viral and became a sensation did people realize that they had missed something rare and beautiful. They had missed something great. In today's scripture lesson, Samuel gets a lesson on recognizing greatness. He's in Bethlehem to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the next king. And 
Jesse brings out all of his sons, and as they pass before him, eldest to the youngest, uh, the Samuel is asking the Lord, is this the one? In fact, the Bible tells us that Samuel takes one look at the eldest, Eliab, and he gets all excited. He says, surely this is the one the, the Lord's appointed. But God interrupts Samuel's thought, and he says this, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. God does not see as people see, for people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. To get the full force of this observation, it helps to know the backstory, because there is a backstory. The backstory, it happens way back in chapter 10. It's when they anoint Saul to be king over Israel. Saul, who is not working out, who the Lord has just rejected. Right before the ceremony to anoint Saul king of Israel, things got weird. They couldn't find Saul. They couldn't do the ceremony because they couldn't find him. They couldn't find Saul because he was hiding. And so they go hunting for Saul, and finally God tips them off that he's hiding in the baggage. And so they find him, and they drag him out of the baggage, and they stand him in front of the people, and the Bible says Saul was head and shoulders taller than any of the people. And as soon as the Bible makes this observation, Samuel exclaims, Wowza! Look at him! He's huge! There's nobody like him among all the people. Samuel's just totally bowled over by his appearance. Now, if you understand the backstory, you understand why when, Saul gets, when Samuel gets carried away by Jesse's eldest son, Eliab, God warns him, people judge by outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Because Samuel had been judging by the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And in fact, maybe hiding in the baggage tells you a little something about Samuel's fearful heart. But we judge people by their appearance all the time. We are infatuated by beauty and size. We are dazzled by celebrity and power and glitter. We think wisdom and wealth naturally go together. We are awed by people who attempt to put on an eminence front. Study after study shows that people think that more beautiful people are smarter and better at what they do. And yet, there is no basis for this thinking. In 2015, the Journal of Evolution and Human Behavior published an exhaustive study. And the title of the study tells you pretty much all you need to know. No relationship between intelligence and facial attractiveness in a large genetically informative sample. As the title tells you, there is no relationship between facial beauty and intelligence. And it showed previous studies that had shown a correlation and found that they all suffered from confirmation bias. People look on outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If we want a great life, we would do well to recognize that God is not impressed by the externals. Now on this score, I, I think I need to clear up some potential confusion. For in this series, sermon series, we're going to be examining David's life for lessons on greatness. And it would be very tempting, I think, for us to say, well, of course David was great. He was king. You're going to be great if you're king. But that wasn't the secret to David's greatness. It wasn't. Israel had lots of kings. Being the ruler was no secret to their greatness. Just, just read what the Bible, the prophets in the Bible say about these kings, some of whom are really corrupt. Some of them were terrible, astonishingly bad. Being king didn't make them great. Too often it just put them into a position where they could do truly awful things. And so this sermon series is not going to tell you how to become an all-powerful ruler or how to achieve all of your dreams. 
your dreams of greatness. In fact, David shows us that true greatness is not found when we live into our dreams, but when we live into God's dreams for us. In fact, I think it's indisputable that David was at his worst when he was pursuing his own dreams. David was great because at his best, he was courageous, he was a friend, he took responsibility, and he approached things as a servant. God tells Samuel what is great about David. God looks at the heart. It wasn't David's age, it wasn't his size, it wasn't his experience, it wasn't his education. It was his heart. And in Hebrew thought, the heart is the seat of the affections. The heart attaches itself to objects that it loves and pays attention to. The heart directs your will, it will shape your life. And God saw David's heart and saw that it was good. In fact, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. The heart is where you're going to find greatness in yourself and in others, and it's why you need to pay attention to your heart. And as you interact with others, pay attention to their heart as well. What do you love? What are your priorities? What are your intentions? What are your motivations? Now, it is tempting to conclude that David was chosen by God because David had a perfect heart, right? I mean, that's the temptation. God looks on the heart. But it is clear from what we know about the rest of the story of David's life that David did not have a perfect heart. And yet the great God who searches all hearts, before whom no secret is hid, and every thought is known, had to have seen the potential for lust that would eventually lead him to have an affair with Bathsheba. He had to have seen David's instinct for self-preservation that led him to cover up the affair by killing Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. God did not choose David because he was perfect. He saw the good and he saw the painful and God chose him anyway. God knows your heart. God knows the best about you, how you want to serve God and how you want to be a witness, how you want to love God and others and be a faithful family member and faithful member of our community, citizen, a faithful citizen of this earth. And God also knows the other pieces of your heart, the hearts that you'd rather not pay too much attention to, your insecurities, your anxieties, your fears. God knows the broken pieces, the sense of failure, maybe the resentment, the pain, the things that make you doubt yourself. And yet God chooses you. God chooses you for greatness. God has dreams for your life and God wants to use your life to be a blessing to the world, to channel the gospel of love and peace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to build bridges between people in a broken world, to bring life and justice and flourishing to everyone around us. The secret to finding greatness begins when we look at things the way God does, when we cease to look at the superficial, and we go deeper, and we look at the heart. I invite you to look at your heart and look at the heart of others. Let us pray. Great God, searcher of all hearts, we come before you knowing uh, the broken places of our lives, and yet, it astounds us that you choose us just the same. You choose us out of your grace and mercy, and you forgive us and heal us and strengthen us 
for the great calling you give to us to be followers of your son Jesus, to be servants of love, to care for others, to be people who bring your peace into the world. Lord, we come to you not because our hearts are so strong, but because our hearts are broken. And yet in you, you give us strength. You are our strength. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us they shall come from north and south, from east and west, to sit at table in God's kingdom. Our Lord invites those who trust in Him to take part in this meal that He has prepared. Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please join me in prayer. Praise to you, O God, for all your works. You created the world and called it good. You made us in your image to live together in love. You made a covenant with us. And even when we turned from you, you remained ever faithful. Therefore, with all creation, we sing your praise. Thank you, O God, for sending us your Son. He lived among us and told your story. He healed the sick and welcomed sinners. He shared our pain and died our death, then rose to new life so that we might live, and so that all creation might be restored. Great is the mystery of faith. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we may be his body in the world. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another, until we feast with him and with all your saints in your eternal realm of justice and peace. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Lord, we pray these things and all things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, given for you. Take, eat, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Friends, as long as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. We now invite you to partake of the elements that you have prepared at home. First, take your bread or bread substitute, offering it to one another, saying, the bread of life. Next, take your juice or juice substitute, offering it to one another, saying, the cup of salvation. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, all is prepared. Please join me once again in prayer. Gracious and abundant God, even as we wait for the fulfillment of your creation, you meet us in Christ at this table, in this meal. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and for quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. Now send us out into your world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all whom we meet. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for worship online today. Uh, we're, we're, if you're visiting with us, we hope that you will make yourself known, and we look forward to meeting you in person because we do have in-person worship. Also invite our members to share this on social media so we can spread the word of uh, how people can find true greatness. Uh, we are very dependent upon your giving and faithfulness and giving, and I so appreciate people who have uh, supported this church through its ministry during this time of pandemic. Uh, we are now coming out of the pandemic and we really need your support as we begin to open up and uh, meet in person. So uh, I encourage you to be keep current on your pledges and uh, you can donate online. Uh, there should be a slide up that will tell you how to donate. I have uh, a bit of sad news and that is uh, our Beloved Brian Monty is going to be leaving us to take a full-time position. And um, he's moving on from our part-time position, and we're really going to miss him. 
His last Sunday with us will be Mother's Day, May 9th. On a happier note, the Young Adults Fellowship Group will be meeting this coming Saturday down at the Hardywood Brewery near the stadium from 6 to 8. Kids are welcome, and I look forward to seeing you there. Now, uh, here's a message from our own Landry Duvall. Hello everyone. This is an exciting time in the life of our church as we begin moving back into in-person gatherings at RRPC. I'm particularly excited to share that beginning this Wednesday evening, our Chancel Choir and River Road Ringers will be resuming our regular rehearsals after over a year of separation due to the pandemic. I want to take this opportunity to personally invite you to consider joining us in music ministry at the church. There is no requirement that you read music in any way, and this is such a great way to build community with others. Handbells will rehearse at 6.30 p.m. in the choir room, and the chancel choir will be rehearsing in Kemp Hall at 7.30 p.m. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I would love to talk to you about music at River Road. Now may the grace and peace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and with those whom you love and with those only God can love, wherever they may be, this day, henceforth and forevermore. Amen.